Hi everyone, this lesson is on the endocrine system and feedback loops. So let's start with a question. Here you can see a picture of who was once the world's tallest man at 8 foot 3 inches and an image of who was once the world's shortest man at 1 foot 11. What biological process do you think could explain these extremes? Well, let's think about growth. If I look at average heights right now, in the US the average male height is 5 foot 9 and the average female height is 5 foot 4. Why such a discrepancy between the sexes? I'll let you know the answer is actually evolution, and not for the reasons you think. Turns out that females tend to select mates based on height, whereas males don't. So, females are actually selectively breeding males to be taller. Looking at the world's tallest man and the world's shortest man, these are pretty big extremities from the averages. How is your body doing this? Well, if we know how the body regulates when it starts or stops growing, that should provide us insight into why one person would be so short, maybe they're not getting much of it, and why one person can be so tall, maybe they're getting too much. What's going on behind the scenes here is hormones. There are chemicals that are regulating cellular processes such as growth. So I want us to spend some time looking at the system responsible for this. That system is the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a collection of the body's organs that are able to produce and secrete hormones into the body's fluids. For example, the pancreas secretes insulin, which regulates blood sugar, and the adrenal glands will release adrenaline to cause the fight, flight, or freeze response. They're going to do all of this by using chemical reactions, specifically regulating when they turn on and when they turn off. First, there'll be glands, and those glands can be a variety of different glands. Could be an ovary, could be a pancreas. When they need to cause cellular responses, they're going to secrete a hormone. A reminder that hormones are long distance signaling molecules. That hormone can then go to a bloodstream or any other kind of fluid in a living organism and will be dispersed to a target cell. Hormones are specific. They're molecules that will only attach to corresponding receptors. So this enables them to target a specific tissue. For example, you could send a hormone to only heart cells or only lung cells if the hormone only fits receptors found on those cells. There are two main classes of hormones that we need to understand, steroid and non-steroid hormones. In both cases, they're going to work by a signal transduction pathway. They're going to be received, transduced, and respond. How that occurs, though, is slightly different in each case. So let's look at a steroid hormone. Steroid hormones are hormones that are fat soluble. A reminder from cell structures that lipid molecules can freely go across the cell membrane, the only molecule that can. So steroid hormones are made of lipids. Because they can freely cross the cell membrane, the way they're going to do their signal transduction pathway is to just go right across the cell membrane and enter the cytosol. In the cytosol, they're going to attach to a corresponding receptor. Once that receptor is activated, it can then go through transduction. And let's say in this example, the response is to make a new protein. So at the end of transduction, those proteins will then go and bind to DNA where it'll be transcribed into RNA, translated into a protein. Some examples of Steroid hormones include estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and cortisol. These are very, very powerful hormones. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those are sex hormones that can change almost every part of your body. And cortisol is a hormone that's released when you experience stress. Why are they so powerful? Because it can go directly across the cell membrane. Its potential impact on the cells in your body is significant because of that. This is different than a non-steroid hormone. Non-steroid hormones are not made out of lipids. Typically, they're a protein. That makes them water-soluble. For our purposes, what we care about is that they cannot cross the cell membrane. So for their signal transduction pathways, they're going to need to attach to a receptor on the outside of the cell, on the cell membrane. That will then activate another enzyme on the cell surface which will then act as a secondary messenger to carry the signal inside the cell where it will then have a response. Because they aren't able to directly go across the cell membrane, their ability to activate other cells is limited. They're not going to activate as many cells as something like a steroid hormone. So here's a diagram showing both. Would you be able to identify which one is showing a steroid and which one is showing a non-steroid? 
Well, hopefully you notice the one on the right is a steroid. How do I know that? The ligand, the signaling molecule, went directly through the cell membrane. Whereas the one on the left, the ligand attached to a receptor on the surface, so I know this is a non-steroid hormone. Hormones are often used to regulate homeostasis, so I want to walk you through an example how all of these pieces can fit together. Let's start with being off balance. So homeostasis, we want to maintain stable internal conditions, but that can vary. Sometimes you can get too hot or too cold. In this example, I want us to look at exercise. When you're exercising, your body is off balance because it is needing more energy than it normally requires. So let's see how your body responds to that imbalance. Well, there's going to be something that's detecting the imbalance. There are going to be cells that act as a receptor to signal to the rest of the body, something's off, we need to return to balance. Think of it like in cell communication when you had something like paracrine signaling. Now, this isn't always paracrine signaling, but as an example, you have a cell which detects something and responds. It sends out the signal. That signal is going to be heard by some kind of a control center. For exercise, it's your brain. Your brain is going to receive these signals saying we're off balance, we're off balance, we're low on energy, we're low on energy. That control center is then going to integrate that information and respond. The brain will then, as an effector, have an effect in response to the cause and send out a signal to correct this imbalance. That signal will then bring homeostasis back to where it began. So if you're working out, that's having a faster heart rate and sweating. The faster heart rate increases the oxygen in, increases the amount of ATP, and the sweating corrects any increase in your body temperature to cool you down. Feedback loops are a very common way of maintaining homeostasis, and they come in two varieties. They can be a negative feedback loop or a positive feedback loop. So let's go over each. A negative feedback loop is a feedback loop where hormone release stops in response to a decrease in stimulus. That is near impossible to understand as defined, so I'm going to show you a couple examples of negative feedback loops. Let's say I have a specific body condition. I need to maintain 98.7 degrees Fahrenheit as my body temperature. And I start running a little hot while I'm exercising. That's going to get detected by a gland which will then release a hormone in response that triggers the action of lowering your body temperature. Since there's going to be some lag time here, we're dealing with hormones moving through space and time, you're probably going to end up cooling your body temperature a little lower than it needs to be. So your body will respond by another gland releasing another hormone to increase your body temperature up. And this figure eight cycle will happen again and again to keep you at balance. Now, the specific body condition, that 98.7 degrees, is what's determining if the gland detects it and releases it or not. Once you return to a normal body condition, that whole process will shut down. This is what we mean by a negative feedback loop. Let's look at another example. This person's eating a hamburger, and in doing that, there's a bunch of sugar that's going to be entering into their blood. Your body doesn't want to have a high amount of blood sugar. That can lead you into shock. So your body responds, specifically the pancreas, with releasing insulin. Insulin triggers the body to absorb blood from the sugar and take it into your cell's tissues. Now if the blood sugar drops too low, your body can respond by releasing glucagon. Glucagon actually stimulates cells to release sugar into the bloodstream. Let's look at that now in our figure eight example. So if my blood sugar goes really, really high, my insulin is going to be released by the pancreas and that will stimulate the body to take it in. And this will continue until it returns to normal levels. Once it returns to normal levels, the pancreas stops releasing insulin. The stimulus is triggering that stop. Now if the blood's too, blood sugar is too low, the pancreas can release a different one called glucagon and glucagon will then release glucose back into the blood. Now this is different than a positive feedback loop. With a positive feedback loop, this is when as long as the stimulus is present, the action of the hormone continues or the response reinforces, the effect reinforces the response. Here's one example. As temperatures get hotter on Earth, ice is melting. But ice is a really reflective surface, so when we have less ice on Earth, water is actually going to absorb more heat than it did before. But if we absorb more heat than we did before, we're going to melt more ice. But if we melt more ice, we're going to absorb more of the heat than we did before. The effect is in reinforcing the cause, and the cause is reinforcing the effect. Here's another example. As the ocean itself warms, that causes it to release more CO2. But as we release more CO2 in the atmosphere, that causes the ocean to warm. 
you can see that these patterns are cyclical in a positive feedback loop. So looking at both of these, a negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop, a negative feedback loop is when a stimulus can stop a response. Here you're seeing the number of predators. If those go up, we'll have fewer prey. But if there's fewer prey, the predators have nothing to eat, so they decrease. The stimulus stopped it. With a positive feedback loop, the stimulus is reinforced by the response. Success reinforces motivation, and motivation reinforces success. I hope this short video was a helpful introduction into feedback loops in the endocrine system, and I'll see you next time.